These can come off the table. We're done. By the way, I like these saws. But you know something? As much as I like my tweaked 562s, this damn thing still sits in the truck. 555. What's that say? All right, moving on. Next week's subject is going to be regular saws. And at this point, I really don't have a good sampling of a regular saw other than my uh, 555. So I've got a 357, I guess, that fits in there. Um, well, Bob added another requirement. He wants to have not only regular saws, so the boring numbers like uh, 42 and 257 and 2245 Johns, you know, that class of saw. But he wants us to run open port saws. Now, yet again, if you've gone back in my videos, I built an open port 350. What I want to put together for, for next weekend, for that particular video, is possibly another one of those open port 350s, because they run good. I mean, they run really good. The other two saws, and maybe three, we'll see, that I've got that we can put into that video. This is an old Husqvarna, and I can't remember. I believe it's a 75 or a 65. I'm not sure which, but something of that class. And I really don't know what I have. So maybe a project today is just to see what this saw is, see if I've got compression and spark. Um... Here's a 257, and this saw here is kind of a mid-range saw that was sold, in, I believe, in the 90s. Bob will have to go through this. It's an open port design. Um, its cousin is the 51 through 55 series. For that matter, the handle, the tank handle on these is the same as a 51 or a 55. For that matter, this came off a 55. The cover and cases are different than a 55. Um, I took the muffler off and painted it to make it look a little nicer. It's got a rudimentary anti-vibe in that you've got those rubber bushings. It's of the same family as the 254 and the 262, which is a, a much heralded saw. Bob says it's overrated. I don't know. I never had one. So I believe I'm going to get this one going. The only thing I need for this saw is, I forgot, now that I've got the handle, is I need a throttle wire or rod, and I need a choke lever. And this is a complete saw. It's got a, the top end's perfect. So this 257 is going to be one of my regular saws. This is a saw that you saw in one of my videos before where it was kind of like a cheap firewood saw. I really didn't know what I had. Um, what I did was I pirated the plastic I had on another one of these small saws. So it has a 42 special cover, a 42 pull start, cases say 42, and the side cover came off a of 42, but that top end is a 242. And I believe that it's a closed port top end. I really do. I'm not sure, but I believe it's a closed port. And if it is, I'm going to tease Bob. This is kind of a setup. Because he's going to come with an open port version. And if i got a closed port version and mine runs better, I'm going to be going, geez, Bob, both got 42s. How come mine runs better than yours? And just see how that goes. Hopefully he won't watch this video. But one of my projects for today is to get this thing a bar and chain and just get it ready to go. Great little saw. And like you, you've already seen it once, but it has been sitting for quite a while. And I had to rob from this one right here. This saw is really interesting. You know, it's 
partly it's a 238 and a 238 is well literally 38 cc's it's a closed port top end and it's a screamer this is a really really uh, surprisingly strong saw for what it is now I've run this for a bunch of years and it's had to sacrifice some of its stuff to make the 42 run um, but at some point I think I need to get this one going again because every time I run that saw it surprises me I use it for a lemon saw for the longest time and then we got into the 350s and you saw all the 350s and that got put on the shelf retired where it's going right now when we're done and really the difference between the 238 and the 42 fundamentally is the 42 is supposed to have a open port top end and this has got a little higher state of tune with a closed port top end um, the 242 XP is the hot rod of this class Bob has one of those but he's not bringing it because it has a closed port top end not the open port top end so this one has to go back in the shelf it doesn't fit there was a 246 version of that saw as well and I believe it was also an open port top end and I think I'm gonna shut the camera off I'm gonna see if I can dig out some parts to to point that out all right look what I found in the junk pile a perfectly good 350 bottom end you've got a crank and a clutch and a wrist pin bearing and an ignition system I think that one's going to get an open port top end and here is geez it says 44 millimeter boy it doesn't feel right but this is a an open port 246 top end that's what that is shuffle this around again and the reason why I think that's a closed port <laughs> evil laugh is when I look at the side of the cylinder, at the casting, let me pull this cover so you can see the same thing I'm looking at. You know, this whole 200 series of Husqvarna's in the 80s and 90s, you know, for the guy who's looking for saws on the cheap or likes working on saws, I think, in my humble opinion, and I will get arguments, but I believe that they're the easiest saws to fix and work on on the planet. There's nothing even close. Look at this area right here. And look at the same area right there on this one. See it? Man, that looks like a closed port where it'd have a loop in there. It says uh, 242 on the top. And I got it out of a junk pile a while back. So I might have a cheater saw here. And I'm not going to tell Bob. And it's going to have all the 42 plastic on it. You know, it says 42. It says 42 all over this saw. Today, I need to get it up and running. And I need to get a bar and chain for it. I'm not quite sure what I have in the shop that fits these, these saws. Now we've we've talked about this series quite a bit. 234, 238, 42, 242 XP, 246. And I think pound for pound, those are among the most impressive saws ever built. I really don't believe you could buy a saw today at 40 cc's that's gonna make any more power than that one right there. I really don't. Maybe the latest and greatest, but even that, I suspect, will come up lacking. Those things just make a lot of power for the size. Just a very good design. 
I can tell you that the uh, 543 doesn't make that kind of power. Uh, they're nicer saw, don't get me wrong. I would highly recommend one. We have one, and my wife, for one, loves it. Um, but in terms of raw power, I think that 42 there has got more. Um, my 238 in time cuts is really not far off a 350, and that's really impressive. Not a built 350, but a stocker, you know, like a 44 millimeter stocker. It's just not that far off. So today, I need to come up with a bar and chain. And I, th I think the only thing I have that's going to fit it is maybe a total bar. I just don't know if I have a chain for it. Now, I'm not a fan of these one bar stud covers. But in their defense, they've got these two bar studs. To, you know, when you're reefing on the bar, you've got the same amount of rotational resistance with those as you would from a two bar studs. But you know, the cover from side to side is just not going to have as much support with just that one bar nut. So I'm not a fan of that. That's the one thing I don't like about that saw. Let me see what I've got. I've got this total from Forrester. This is an 18. And it wants a 325, 50, 72. I think that's a little bit big. I really do. I think this will be on a 350, or actually since it's brand new, I'll probably move it along. By the way, I have to give a plug. I have to have to give two plugs, and I don't do this often. But um, first is to this series of Forrester Bar for the small saws. You know, I don't care what anyone says. Um, these are carried by a bunch of dealers. They're sold through Auburn's. And dollar for dollar, for like a 350 series saw, you can't beat these. They're not laminated. They're actually a one-piece bar. You know, the, the stock, removable, replaceable tips. I've had great luck with them. You know? So I recommend these. The second is this guy right here. And again, I never do this. Let me see if I can get it up here. But he's, a, he's got an eBay store. Online, he calls himself Definitive Dave. And every time I've ordered stuff from him, it comes quickly. The price is good. And he has sort of a unique set of uh, products that he sells. And... Of all the online stores that I've dealt with, this is the one that has me keep coming back. So here's a recommendation. And like I said, I don't do this often, but you know, he's doing fine. He doesn't need me saying anything, but I think people need to understand that that's one of your good guys. That's one of your better ones right there. Bars from my little 42. So uh, I've got these, these bars right here. No. <laughs> By the way, not recommended. All right? Good lead-in. Because on the bars, they usually have uh, these, these markings, this lettering, to tell you what it is. This one here is a 20-inch bar, 3 8 chain, 72 drive lengths, and the, and the slot or the groove that the chain goes in is 50 thousandths or 1.5 millimeter. That's this bar. These are the three candidates I found in the junk pile. Well, one on the wall, and then these two in the junk pile that are going to go on my small, my small saws for the get-together coming up the next week. This is a total brand. And it's a one piece steel with the slot milled in so it's not a laminate bar and it's got a removable tip and that means it's a better bar <laughs> in short I like the fact that it has the oil holes a little bit bigger than some the part number is T368Z R2 16 inch it says 58 
325.66. The, the 16 is how long it is, 16 inches. The 58 is a dot oh five eight inch slot width. Tells you what kind of chain you can put on there. 325, and that is because of the sprocket. It'll only take 325 chain. And it takes 66 drive lengths. And it's made by Zamara. That's T-S-U-M-U-R-A, branded by Total. Excellent stuff. Excellent, excellent, excellent bars. Highly recommend these things. Now, at first I didn't think I had a chain. Turns out I did. And this one here, if you remember what I just finished saying on the bar, H21 Husqvarna, 66 drive lengths, GX is like an LGX style, 325.058 or 1.5 millimeter for the slot. Don't know which saw that's going to get that one. I've got these Dolmar branded bars. Got them for the right price. Now, they are a laminate bar. If you see these little spots right here, there's your first clue. Price is your second clue. And this laminated bar is, of course, much less expensive. Does not have a removable tip. So when that tip is gone, you throw the bar away. Um, and the steel is probably not as good, so it's going to wear out anyway. And on it, it says Dolmar VW.325, which is the chain size, dot, uh, or 64, which means 64 drive lengths, 1.5 or dot 058, and that's, again, the width of the slot. So that tells you what chain goes on that bar. Um, now, the way a laminated bar works is basically you have a cut out piece of steel in this shape one for each side and then in the middle they have another piece cut out that's smaller to allow the groove to be there and basically they slap those three pieces of steel together like a sandwich and then spot weld them well there's a whole lot of reasons why that's not quite as good as is even this one right here which is not well that's a laminated bar too son of a gun Oh, look at that. That is also a Dolmar bar. This is what it looks like after a season. You know something? This was the bar that was on that first 350 uh, Hudsel saw I think I built a year or so ago. And you can see what it looks like after a year's worth of use. It got a lot of use. You know, maybe I'll use this one. It needs a reason to exist. But you can tell from just the way there's wear. It wear, well, it got a lot of use. It's not fair to, to uh, say anything about this bar. It got a lot of use. But you can see where the chain was wearing into the top. You know? So one of those two bars is going to go on, or one of those three bars is going on that 42, and I haven't quite decided yet which one. Probably this one. Anyway, here's a bar. I think this bar is going to go on my 42. No, it's not the best bar there is, but got rid of those. Well, most of it. Probably want to put it up in a vise. I don't want to work so hard that I make those uneven. Then you cut in a circle. I just want to take the burrs. Off. That's all I'm doing is I'm working the burr, not getting into the actual wear surface. That looks good enough. I don't know, there's one guy online that was trying to convince me about how these outboard clutch saws are so much better balanced and all this and that than the inboard clutch like the steels and the 372s. And to that I say bull crap. Not true. You know, much more of a pain in the neck to deal with and just simple things like that. You know, and the other reason is one of the big arguments was, oh my God, uh, on these new whiz-bang saws, the distance from the bar to 
the side of the cover was optimized for limbing where you can lay that saw right flat and there's not a lot of distance between the side of the bar and the side of the co cover. Yet again, well, an inboard clutch, that distance from the side of the cover to the bar is less because the clutch is inside. So I completely reject the concept of an outboard clutch being more balanced, uh, better for um, the way a saw feels and handles. There's reasons why I like the outboard clutch, that's not one of them. I like the outboard clutch concept because it takes the heat away from the cases, which is, I think, one of the reasons why some of the higher revving and uh, more stressed Husqvarna brand saws do that. Husqvarna did it, uh, I think, to uh, keep the heat away from that clutch side bearing. You change the dynamics of the saw because you've got this spinning mass a little bit further out. You know, somebody might argue that yeah it's geometrically more balanced because it centers the spinning mass as the flywheel and the clutch a little further apart all that crap you know what a bunch of junk the fact of the matter is uh, most people are never going to even pay attention to that but what they will pay attention to is how much of a hassle it is to get a chain on their bar on the one versus the other that is something that will affect them every time they use the saw. And this is a working chain break. Last time you saw this saw, I did not have a working chain break. Uh, safety, you know, a lot of times we overlook the safety aspect of saws. And I think in future videos, I'm going to spend more and more time talking about that. And these little high revving saws, you know, you'd think, oh, they're little tiny saws. It's not going to give you a problem. Think about it. You got a, a high revving little saw and get this tip of into a, a tree that comes back at you at the speed of light. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's gonna hurt. Now the chain guard and chain break concept is gonna help. Um, I believe that learning how to work a saw safely and properly is the best preventive measure a person can take. I think it goes back to PPEs as well. Obviously, when you're working in the brush, having a good set of chaps makes a lot of sense. But I think a, a face mask, you know, a helmet with ear protection is, is pretty important, you know, but that assumes the danger comes from above. The helmet with a face mask is better because it can deflect brush coming back and slapping in the face, but at least it gives you some level of protection should you uh, really make a big mistake and have that chainsaw come flying up at you. One of the things I want to do this year is radically upgrade my PPEs. Partly because I am getting older. Um, partly because I think it's the right thing to do. I think more people should spend as much time and money on their PPEs as they do on a lot of the other bling accessories they do. For example, guy is new to chainsaws and he's got a little bit of money to spend does he take that brand new 372 and send it out to a professional porting guy to make it a cool saw to get or does he buy a new helmet and chaps um, no one's gonna listen to me but I'm gonna tell you go out and buy the chaps and helmet and all that stuff before you get your saw ported please you know get the priorities right and I think the second thing is, another little bit of a rant here, but before you go spend a bunch of money on having a guy make your saw run like crazy, also learn how to sharpen the chain. Find the right chain bar combination for your saw and learn how to sharpen it because one of the points of my earlier video was you can get a lot of performance change in the chain itself and can easily negate a $300 port job, $400 port job, plus shipping, plus downtime. A good sharp chain and good technique uh, can make a huge difference. So I guess that's my second part of the rant, is good PPEs and good bar and chain before you go out and spend money on bling because you want to have a cool saw.
looks to me like I've got a problem in interference here. Hear it popping and catching? That's exactly what that is. It's got a the drive sprocket is shot on this little saw, so boy I hope I have one. But little things like that, you know, getting that right, getting the bar right, getting the chain size right. If I put time on this saw this summer, I'll figure out what I need for rakers to optimize that little saw. It's worth spending the time on that before spending money on other stuff. It really is. Little things like that just make such a huge difference. It's interesting what you find in the junk pile. So I pulled this. I realized that my clutch on my 42 is missing that spring right there. You see how it is in the 238? You got both those. So obviously I need one of those. If you can find one. And so I went to the junk pile and found this. This one is a... Two forty-six set of cases. So what I'm thinking is maybe I just put the bigger clutch on. And I found this. God only knows where they came from. Have got no idea. That's a whoop piston. And here is a cylinder. with a nice piston, and I believe this is a 42. Yeah, see how it's got the open ports? That's a 42 cylinder, is my guess. And there's the piston and ring. That's actually a good top end. My hunch is that top end came off of that little saw, and here's another one. Okay piston. Not great. Look at that. That's a closed port top end. You see that? This, I believe, I believe this is a smaller 238 top end. Yeah, that's exactly what this is. This is a 238. That's what's on this saw. But it also illustrates the difference in both bore 238 is a tiny little thing but also the open versus closed ports 42 238 stock muffler look at that I'm going to keep the stock I think what I'm going to do is take that clutch and put it on here because I believe that's a closed port 242 top end. So that's a bit of a cheater saw. Bob will never know the difference. He'll see all those numbers, 42 and stuff like that, and he'll be just pleased. <laughs> that's a sleeper saw. So anyway, camera off. I'm going to move clutches around. Yeah, I kind of made up a, a little tool that would get into that clutch. A little bit of air power. <laughs> Off it came. Clutch drum looks good. Little chunks of metal in there because I think the clutch was beginning to eat itself. I'd say that's a little bit whooped, don't you think? Now the question is, do I have one? Let's see if we got one. Close enough. Got that hex to work with. Love that thing. Oh my god, I've had that for so many years. $25 piece of crap. By the way, this was uh, on sale for like $99. Wow. Look at the clutch on the 246 
It's got those teeth that go down inside here. This one does not. You know, I wonder if they have different cranks. Different way of driving the uh, oil pump because that's completely different. And this clutch is different as well. Now the question is, will it retro? This, this certainly won't. That deal is, is unique to this saw. But the question is, can I put this clutch inside here? I think I can. That has to stay with that. That has to stay with that saw right there. All right, new star sprocket. I got to get some oil to put in that little bushing. Camera off. Um, while I was rummaging around, check this out. You know those muffler mods we keep doing? Hmm, I don't think we were the first ones to think like that. They go on like that. So this is off of 240, oh, 242. Look at that, it says 242. And this is off of 42. Um, I have a gutted one of these on that saw, but I think I'm going to keep this in case I want to build it back to a 242 original at some point. One of the things you look for on these old saws, I had done a couple of 346s a while back, and the thing was rattling and making all kind of noise. Couldn't figure out what it was. It almost sounded like bad bottom and bearings until... I had pulled off the clutch and realized there was an awful lot of slop in that bearing. And that's where all that noise was coming from. Put it back together, it's still running. Like it was on the other saw. Now remember, these are always reverse threaded. Alright. So now we have a clutch. And we have a, a new rim sprocket cheap saws for average guys. How's that? Got to come up with something for a title here. And every time I deal with one of these damn things, I end up saying the same thing to the know-it-all expert who keeps telling me that those outboard clutches are better. No. Not bad. Much better. All right. Let's get this saw back together and see if it'll fire and, and uh, you know, see what we have for a saw. You know, this ought to be the addendum to the cheap firewood saw because that's, that's where that saw was first introduced. It was funny because I had it in the junk pile and I couldn't uh, figure out why it wasn't running well. And it was the one that I literally had the, the spark plug in finger tight because at some earlier point, when I had gotten that saw, I had done a, a quick check and checked ignition and things like that, you know. There we go. Working chain break. Fresh chain, old bar, old saw. And this is my entry to next week's Average Boring Saws, Open Port Saws. And only you and me know the truth. And we'll see if Bob figures it out. Because it may not matter. He needs one more thing. One more thing. That's what it needs.
All right, that one's ready. I'm going to go uh, charge up the battery and eat some lunch. And I know it oils because it's sprayed oil everywhere. So it oils pretty well. So this is the 42 entry to the boring saw get together, supposed open port. I think next on the list is going to be the uh, discussion on the 257. I have a little bit to say about it, but I can't finish it today because I'm missing two parts. So anyway, camera off.